Welcome to another Foldit Lab Report. My name is Bikep here at the Institute for Protein Design with my colleague Ian H. If this is your first time tuning into a Foldit Lab Report, we produce these videos on the first of every month to tell you more about the science behind Foldit. In this episode, we are returning to the lab to tell you more about what happens to your Foldit designs after a puzzle closes. In the last video, we showed how a Foldit player solution becomes a piece of custom DNA that we can work with here in the lab. We strongly recommend watching that video before this one so that the whole story makes sense. See the link in the description below. For part two, we're starting right where we left off, with a flask full of billions and billions of cells. These bacterial cells have been growing and growing and producing tons of the protein that we want to study. But before we can run any tests on this protein to figure out whether it's folded or whether it does what it was designed to do, we first need to purify it. You see, our protein is just one of many molecules inside each of these cells. The cells also contain all the other molecules that are needed to keep them alive. This includes other kinds of proteins, lipids from the cell membrane, and sugars, and metabolites, and DNA, and vesicles, and organelles, and ribosomes, and lysosomes, and Unless we can separate our protein from all of these other molecules, we won't be able to study the protein that we actually care about. The essence of protein purification is to separate different molecules based on their different properties. We could try to go in with a microscope and pull out every molecule that we want, but we don't have tweezers that small, and there are millions of copies of our protein in each cell in this flask. We're going to need a better way. The first thing we do is break open the cells to free our protein that's trapped inside. To do this, we don't use a hammer to hit the cells, we use sound waves. This machine is a sonicator. It has a metal rod that vibrates with super high intensity, emitting high energy sound waves that rip open nearby cells. Once all of the cell walls have been broken up, all of the molecules that were inside spill out. This includes the protein that we are after, but it also includes all of the guts and other junk from inside the cells. If we left this tube of busted up cells upright for several days, gravity would start to pull the largest and densest particles to the bottom. The other molecules, however, are soluble and they'll stay dissolved in the liquid. This is a key difference between these molecules that we can take advantage of. Our protein should be super soluble so it's not going to settle down to the bottom, even if many of its insoluble neighbors do. Now, instead of waiting for Earth's gravity to do the work, we have another machine in the lab that can create some artificial gravity for us. We use a centrifuge to spin our samples at super high speeds. If you've ever been inside a spinning ride at an amusement park, you know exactly what's happening here. The spinning creates a force that mimics gravity except that it pushes outward from the spinning rotor instead of down towards the Earth. In this case, the force we are applying to our broken up cells is about 18,000 times stronger than the gravity you feel on Earth. For reference, a carnival ride might top out at two or three times Earth's gravity. And astronauts can sometimes endure about nine times the force of gravity before passing out, but that's only for a few seconds. After the centrifuge has been spinning for about 20 minutes, we can see some insoluble gunk has collected at the bottom of the tube, while all of our soluble proteins are still dissolved in solution. We've successfully separated the insoluble and the soluble molecules. Now we need to isolate our protein from all the other soluble proteins that our bacteria made naturally. To make this step of the purification process much easier, we've modified our protein in a special way. We've tagged the end of our protein with a chain of histidine residues, which will stick tightly to nickel ions. In this tube are tiny beads covered in blue nickel ions. We pour our mixture of soluble proteins through these beads, but our tagged proteins will stick to the nickel. Then we can wash away all of the molecules that didn't stick, leaving just our protein behind. The final step is to release our protein from the nickel. We do this by adding a chemical that likes to bind nickel even more than our protein. This kicks our protein off of the beads, and it then drips down into a collection tube. We are left with a tube that contains billions and billions of copies of our protein. Now we're ready to study this bad boy. We started this journey with a Foldit Player solution. 
a digital hypothesis about how this protein design will fold. Now, with this pure protein sample, we can measure in the lab whether the protein folds up like we predicted it would. In the next video in this series, we'll show you more about how we study these folded proteins. And that brings us to this month's design of the month. This month we have a design from Puzzle 2172. This is a CD47 binder design from Loki Euling and Mr. Zanav. Um, so here I like to view all of these designs with the protein design view preset. So I can see all of the polar nitrogens and oxygens that need to make hydrogen bonds. Um, so this looks like an excellent three helix bundle design. Uh, three helix bundles tend to be very stable because they have lots of secondary structure, these helices, and very short, stable loops connecting the helices. Um, we see that there are lots of orange hydrophobics in the interior and lots of blue hydrophilic side chains on the outside of this design. And that should help this protein fold up and remain soluble. However, at the interface, of course, we expect to see some orange hydrophobic contacts because these orange hydrophobics will give us tight binding since they like to be buried and they can be buried when they bind to the target. So uh, this is nice. I like that we are burying this exposed leucine here on the target. Uh, that's a nice sticky handhold that we can grab onto and this design makes very nice packing arrangements around this leucine. Um, I also like this tyrosine here which packs pretty nicely against another tyrosine in the target. Um, so this looks like a good packing interaction and furthermore this hydrogen bond on the binder side uh, making a contact with the target may give us some specificity bonuses here. Um, there are a couple of polar atoms in the interior of the binding site that I'm a little bit worried about. Um, we can check our buns objective and we see that it does flag a couple of these atoms here. Um, so this is something to be careful of. Whenever we have buns, buried unsatisfied polar atoms at the interface, that can prevent binding. So this could be a little bit worrisome, although there's enough good hydrophobic packing otherwise that it might be able to cancel it out. Um, the other thing that I would really like to praise about this solution is that we have some excellent binder metrics, a DDG of negative uh, 48 kilocals per mole and an extremely high contact surface of, of about 460. Um, so these are very nice binder metrics. We like um, that this binder makes a complementary shape against the target, which gives us high contact surface, and all of that hydrophobic packing gives us tight binding in this large negative DDG. Um, so this looks like a great design, an excellent teamwork from Loki Oiling and Mr. Zanav. As a reminder, please, please share your favorite designs with scientists using the Upload for Scientists feature. We love to see which designs you think are the most fascinating regardless of how they rank on the leaderboards. That's all we have for this month. As always, thanks for watching, thanks for playing, and we'll see you next time.